Okay, so a gas in a container is a rather uh, fundamental setting in physics. And if you think about it, a, the level of sophistication that we have reached with a quantum gas in a, con a container, that is rather unprecedented. Um, I mean, we can put bosons in, fermions, we can weakly interacting, strongly interacting, we can put lattices in, we can uh, detect individual atoms, we can manipulate them, we can rotate it, we can make topologically non-trivial systems, we can put molecules in, uh, so a huge variety of things we can do with this simple setting. It's a bit surprising that um, there had been less attention to the setting of two containers. Two, two containers, each with a gas. Of course, you may ask, uh, what's the point? I mean, the, a very nice point was shown in the very early days of uh, Bose-Einstein condensation, of course, uh, the interference of two condensates. Also, uh, experiments on the Josephson effect. In general, I think the setting of two containers, and if you connect the containers, is indeed a rather different one, because you can have non-equilibrium uh, situations, you can have transport from one container to the other, you, you have, I mean, if you think of situations like uh, heat engines, I mean, you need at least uh, two containers, um, and it is not so obvious that if we put into those two containers our sophisticated quantum gases that we will always understand uh, what is going on. So let's just look at the basic things that we might uh, encounter. That's of course particle transport. If you put more atoms in one part of the container, you can expect that they are transported into the other container. You can expect, uh, for example, heat transport. You heat one container, and then heat will be transported from one to the other container. And even though, I, I, I mean, later in the talk, we will see a situation where one part of the container is hotter than the other part, but the temperature doesn't equilibrate. So it's a bit of uh, a, a funny situation. One might also think of uh, spin transport. Maybe uh, one can devise little filters or valves that maybe just one spin component can go from one container to uh, the other container. Okay, so there are quite a few things one can, just from general way of looking at it, uh, think about doing with two Containers. So experimentally, how uh, can one do that? What we do is we take a cloud of fermionic lithium-6 atoms in this elongated trap, 300 micrometers, and then we shape our trap with additional laser beams. So we come from the side with a laser beam, a repulsive laser beam that separates the clouds in two, into two parts. So these are the two containers and we have a, a two-dimensional plane in between. And then we have an additional repulsive laser beam which then tapers this region so that we have a little kind of quantum point contact between those two regions. And then this attractive laser beam, this red laser beam that changes the potential depths in this region in kind of, in a way you can understand that that will change locally the chemical potential. So with this beam we can adjust our chemical potential in this junction region. Okay, so we have uh, such a system and let's now do the most simple experiment uh, that we put more atoms in one side than in the other side. Okay, what do we expect? I mean, we expect then that over time the uh, atoms will flow from one to the other side. And in the experiment, what we do is after a certain 
time, uh, we switch the system off and let the system expand and, well, it just shortly expand and take uh, absorption images. Okay, you can see here an example of such an absorption image and you can determine the atom number on the left, on the, on the right, and you can also determine in the usual way uh, the energy. And then using the equation of state um, for the fermionic system, um, you can get the chemical potential, the compressibility of the gas, and the temperature. And by making such measurements at different points in time, you can also uh, determine uh, the currents. And typically, the currents uh, decay exponentially. And the time constant, that tells us from the time constant and the knowledge of the compressibility, we can deduce uh, the conductance of the system. So how, how good is the conductance to whatever channel we have in between? OK, so let's look at the conceptually simplest system. That is two non-interacting clouds and a very tiny constriction. So tiny um, that we have to consider the transverse degrees of freedom quantum mechanically. So we, ha we have to quantize the channel in transverse direction. So, and in the experiment, we can change the exact size of this constriction. So that will be a parameter in the next plot. So what is the trapping frequency in the um, transverse direction? And then ag again, we prepare the cloud such that we have more atoms on one side. So we look at uh, the current. And out of these currents, we can deduce the conductance. So what we observe then is uh, such a plot. So this is the transverse confinement, the, the, the vertical, uh, the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis is a conductance. And we see these steps in uh, the conductance. So we see a quantized uh, conductance going to zero. And this is actually not surprising. This is what we had uh, expected. And the, the basic idea of this quantized conductance is uh, the following, consider uh, there's two reservoirs and this quantized uh, uh, tightly confining region. And let's, for simplicity, consider ch that all energies are below the next higher mode. So we just look at the conductance of a single transverse mode. Then um, we can calculate uh, the current from left to right, and that's simply calculated by the density of state of the right moving particles, the, their velocity. We assume a transmission of one, and then we see this current is given by the difference in chemical potentials of Fermi energy divided by H, where H is Planck's constant. So this is a rather famous uh, result that you have a conductance of one over H uh, per channel. It's a consequence of the Heisenberg and of the Pauli principle. So the Heisenberg is that you have the different modes and the step height uh, that is a consequence of Pauli principle because you cannot put more fermions into one single mode. And this is rather robust. Uh, as long as you have fermionic commutation relations, this should, should hold. So the prediction was that in interacting system, if you have a Fermi liquid, it should also uh, be a conductance of one over age. In quantum gases, uh, now one can, of course, in our gas in the container, we can change the interaction. So um, let's have a look what is happening if we change uh, the interactions. So we have two uh, spin states in our gas, and we can control their collisions with, with the Feshbach resonance. So we start off with fairly weak interactions, and we see a, a quantized conductance plateau at 1 over h. And now we increase the interactions, and then uh, we saw a higher plateau. 
I must admit that was to our uh, surprise. Then we went to even higher interactions. The pl plateau went up and fairly close to the Feshbar resonance. Well, we could at least see a shoulder with very high um, uh, conductance. And then on resonance, then you have a superfluid and uh, you get a higher conductance. But in, in the regions here before, the, you have to look at it that uh, it was not uh, yet a superfluid. So we had a strongly interacting normal fluid and uh, we did this conductance experiment. So the question was then, of course, wh why is that the case? And there are basically two uh, theoretical uh, approaches to explain this. One approach is that one assumes, okay, in this region here, uh, this gas has strong superfluid fluctuations. You have preformed pairs. It's, it's not a Fermi liquid. You have preformed pairs. And these bosonic pairs, there you can, as soon as you have bosons, you can fit in more uh, into the channel than, uh, than you would expect uh, from Pauli's principle. The other um, uh, possible explanation is that you have in the channel, since it's one dimensional, you form, you have a, a lower transition temperature, so you have in the channel strong superfluid fluctuation or superfluid, and then you have the, the wave function by a proximity effect reaches out into the normal gas of the reservoirs. And what does that mean? I mean, if you reach out a bit further, so you have a bit larger region of a superfluid, uh, then it can couple to higher transverse modes right at the entrance, and that can give you a higher uh, conductance. So you can have processes uh, where you have Andreev uh, reflections into this uh, uh, superconductor from coming from the, from the second band, and this uh, may explain uh, this higher observed conductance. And it, it might also, of course, be a mixture of, of both uh, processes. Let me now come uh, to another setting, um, to the setting of a unitary Fermi gas, and then looking at the heat uh, transfer, the heat conductance, in such a setting. So we do the following. We prepare this unitary Fermi gas, which is um, where the reservoirs are just above the critical temperature here in the region, in the pockets uh, we are below, we have a superfluid. So here we have superfluids, here in the bigger reservoirs, we are above uh, the critical temperature. And now we, we take a laser beam and stir and heat one side. Okay, so what, what, what do we see? Okay, so we see that one side heats up, okay, and the other side uh, is colder. And we can now take, again, pictures over the time evolution of, uh, of this type. And then we can uh, conclude on chem uh, chemical potential, on the number of atoms, and on the temperature. Okay, what do we observe? We observe the following. We observe, so here's time, so this is in seconds, so four seconds the total time. We observe that there is a rather fast increase in, uh, in rather a strong current and an increase of imbalance, and then this current after a certain time, that current goes to zero. So after a certain time, there is no particle current anymore. And if we now look at the temperature, um, the temperature difference stays constant over the whole time. It just stays constant. But, I mean, particles are flowing, but the temperature uh, stays con constant. And uh, the chemical potential, it jumps to a, a, a certain value, and it, it stays at a, a negative value with some fluctuations in the data. Okay, so let's, um, well, maybe a, a rather general phenomenological picture on what we observe. So, a particle current can be induced by a chemical potential. 
difference. Then, similarly, let's assume we have no particle current, and then we look only at the heat, heat the diffusive heat, uh, due to a, a temperature difference. So that is indicated here. We can then also have coupling between, uh, uh, we can have a particle cu current, which is induced by a temperature uh, difference. That's called uh, the Seebeck effect. Or vice versa, we can have a heat current induced by a chemical uh, potential difference. So that these are the different uh, uh, mechanisms that we have. And one can turn that all into, uh, into transport uh, coefficients. Um, so this transport, I mean, this was the transport coefficient that we had for particles. This transport co coefficient is uh, the transport, the thermal transport for diffusive uh, heat. And alpha C, that is the uh, Seebeck effect, which gives the relation of, of, um, of entropy current and, and particle current, the coupling. Okay, so in, in, these, in this language, so what is happening in our, in our experiment, we have a situation, we prepare this non-equilibrium, initial temperature non-equilibrium. This non-equilibrium, this temperature, due to the Seebeck coefficient, or the, the, the coupling between entropy current and particle current, we drive a current, a particle current, which fills up this reservoir. And then we have a chemical potential difference. And once they balance each other, then the current is zero. And that, that's where uh, the particle number then, then, then gets stuck. And then the only thing what can drive a heat a current is uh, this GT. So it's, it's because we have no longer a particle current, so we just have the, the, the thermal uh, uh, conductance. And this must be very low in our system, the thermal conductance. So we have this imbalanced system. So what can we do experimentally to, to investigate uh, that a bit further? So at some point we should get to a normal situation. So we open up the channel a bit. So we open the channel so that more than a single channel is accessible. And what we then see, so this uh, uh, turquoise is a fairly closed channel. And then if we open the channel, the whole dynamics gets faster. Then we, the particles more quickly create an imbalance. And then on a the longer time scale, they, four second time scale, they go back uh, to an equilibrium. But we have most notably two time scales uh, in this system. We have a time scale uh, for uh, the particle current and then uh, much slower for the heat diffusion. And these time scales, they don't depend much uh, on the number of channels. So that seems to be intrinsic to the system. Okay, so one can also further comp look at what had been done in, in, in thermoelectric effects, and, and one uh, uh, is the wiedemann franz law. And wiedemann franz law uh, states that the particle and heat current is, is, well, the assumption is that it's carried by the same constitutions, constituents, and uh, this is the case for a Fermi liquid. So, and one consequence is that you can calculate then a so-called Lorentz number, which gives a relation between your thermal conductance to your particle conductance. And this, uh, you get a certain value if you have a Fermi liquid. And very clearly, we have a much lower value uh, in our case. So it's clearly uh, a not a Fermi liquid. And we, we, uh, we have a breakdown of the wiedemann franz law. We could also, we can also measure this, the Seebeck coefficient. So the Seebeck coefficient, that describes the coupling between particle and entropy currents. And it 
we, in our experiment, the Seebeck coefficient can be determined at the point where we have no particle current. And then we did, it's simply given by the difference in chemical potential uh, divided uh, by the temperature difference. And this, um, uh, the Seebeck coefficient here has a very uh, a fairly low value, but which interestingly corresponds to a system with same chemical potential or of a non-interacting situation. So this might be l accidentally or it might put some physical meaning. So we have in our total, we have a finite Seebeck coefficient between two superfluids. We have an entropyful uh, flow through the quantum point contact. And if you now look at it in terms of thermoelectricity, we would have, get a very high figure of merit for an electric heat engine. And the reason is we do have a coupling between, via the Seebeck coefficient, between heat and particle current, but we have extremely low just conductance, just heat conductance. So any entropy, irreversible entropy production is low. So that would be a very high figure of merit uh, if one would transfer that into an electric circuit. Um, this brings me to a little uh, uh, quote which I found in the thesis of, uh, uh, of Dominic Husman, who just did his PhD on that. And uh, Ginsburg uh, said, I have been working in physics for 50 years but I continue to be surprised by the role of fashion in scientific research, okay? Attention to or neglect of many problems is difficult to explain. Here, sometimes important roles are played by mysterious forces, similar to forces which dictate fashion. In any case, I still cannot understand why thermoelectric phenomena in superconductors is neglected. Merely referring to experimental difficulties is not enough. Is it possible that this note will reverse the situation? Of course, we had not the, uh, read the note before it was, uh, uh, was stated, and we also don't know whether he would have been happy uh, with our uh, experiments. Um, very briefly, uh, let's have a look at Another situation between two containers, we can also put a lattice between two containers, creating it by individually uh, producing lattice sites, and they are, well, it's like a transport through, through uh, a, a Toblerone, well, spin up, spin down particles, and one can indeed see that a band structure appears at around when once you have four sites. Then you can do the same experiment with strong interactions. And uh, for strong interactions, it is not so obvious what would happen. And maybe the, the it's, so this is in the, uh, well, in the superfluid regime. Uh, but we see what we see is actually not a big change. We again see something like a band structure. And the reason is that a luther emery state is formed. Well, that is something like that, like a, I mean, a super tongs gas with uh, uh, two particles uh, localized per, per periodic site. Um, very quickly on engineering a spin filter. So uh, that is somewhat surprising that one can do that. So it would be nice to have a possibility just to let one spin pass from one container to the other. And for lithium, this looks not so promising. Well, you can look at, make a local magnetic uh, field by uh, taking fairly near resonant beams. And here the trick is we take a super small beam, uh, strongly focused, one micrometer. And this means there is not a lo lot of heating for the whole system. And the probability to, to, to emit a photon is 10% or lot less, and indeed we can see that we can make a spin filter, so depending on this potential, so one spin is blue, or the other one is orange, uh, we can separate these quantized conductance, cur conductance curves. So this opens up quite some possibilities on, on spin-orbit interaction in uh, such experiments. 
Well, this is getting into the uh, time in the question time very, very, very briefly. Driven Fermi Hubbard experiments are of interest because you can uh, produce topologically non trivial systems and many different Hamiltonians. And the question is what happens if you add interactions? And in many experiments, people drive and then say, oh, it all heats up. We recently did an experiment where uh, we followed a proposal of Dieter Jaksch um, that one should get even higher magnetic correlations if you drive near, near the on-site resonance, and we could observe that. We could indeed observe these high spin correlations. And people were a bit surprised, why, why doesn't it heat in your case? And we, we've now done some studies why it doesn't heat. And the reason why it doesn't heat is our lattice structure is a hexagonal lattice and has, a, has the following nature. Um, it has, well, a certain lower, lower band and the higher bands, they are along the direction where we shake, they are fairly flat. Whilst if you would take a cubic lattice, then you would have rather broad bands. And these narrow bands allow us rather large frequency regions where we can drive the system. And we can also kind of measure, I mean, we can measure for 500 milliseconds, we can compare a, a normal Fermi Hubbard Hamiltonian, um, a static one with the identically driven one, and up to 100 or more milliseconds, we get the identical uh, results. And also with interaction, it works. So with this, I would like to conclude, and in particular, I would like uh, to thank um, the transport team uh, that's led by uh, postdoc uh, uh, Laura Corman, Philippe Brontu, who's now at EPFL, and the uh, Lattice team I also briefly mentioned. And here, uh, Michael Messer is here in the audience. Also, Philippe Fabricius is in the audience, Philippe Zupancic and David Dreon. And I thank them all very much. It's a great pleasure to work with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.